The Eternals have declared war on Marvel's mutants, with the Avengers caught in the middle as the war for immortality begins. Marvel's 2022 summer event opens with a devastating, action-packed opening salvo that does not hold back the promise that this is going to have major ramifications for the X-Men and Eternals. If you followed Comic Book Herald's Road to Judgment Day, there likely wasn't much surprising you here, but I did enjoy the fact that Judgment Day number one pulled no punches. In this episode, I'll answer, what's the most devastating part of the Eternals' assault on Krakoa? What comes next, and what secret characters might be involved? Where to find the upcoming tie-in comics. Hey everybody, welcome to Kraken Krakoa, Ease in Eternals, a little bit of Avoidant Avengers. This is Comic Book Herald's Judgment Day number one review. I'm Judgment Dave. If you like the Comic Book Herald YouTube channel or Kraken Krakoa, please consider liking, subscribing, sharing, and commenting. It all helps me out a great deal. You can find full reading orders for the event and for X-Men comics and just comics in general over at comicbookherald.com with links here in the show notes. Spoilers for Discuss Comics will follow. Writer Kira Gillen, artist Valerio Shidi, colors by Marta Gracia, letters by Clayton Cowles. Throughout the build to Judgment Day, Druig, newly elected Prime Eternal for his role in subduing Thanos, who had a Scaramucci-esque reign of his own as Prime Eternal prior, has made it plain his intention to treat mutants as excess deviations, and therefore part of the Eternal's sacred duties to correct, or put more accurately, destroy, kill, and damage extensively. In Judgment Day number one, we officially see Drew go to the Eternals Leadership Council to get the go-ahead to go to war using the Uni Mind, aka the collective psychic powers and essence of all Eternals, and unsurprisingly, he's given the big thumbs up all around. Now, we know the reality is Druig doesn't really care whether or not mutants count as their traditional deviant foes, he just wants a target to keep himself looking good and in power. There's a smattering of jealousy that comes across with the recent reveal that Krakoa has the secret to mutant immortality, and there's some nice framing here from Gillen in terms of Eternals as the old gods and the Krakoan mutants, as Magne Magneto famously put it in House X number one, as the new gods. Druig's ace in the hole here is that he's working with the artist formerly known as Moira McTaggart, aka Evil Robot Moira, aka Moira.exe. I won't go into my feelings about the great reduction of Moira's place in the Krakoa era of X-Men here, since I tend to do it every few weeks or so on the CBH livestreams, but effectively she's boiled down to a grudge-holding former mutant scorned. And her knowledge of how mutant resurrection works in the ins and outs of Krakoa through the five, the five that make resurrection possible, allows for the initial assault tactics on Krakoa. Now, as predicted, the Eternals execute a surgical strike towards the Mutant Five, trying to take resurrection off the board, wiping out mutant telepaths with the combined might of the Unimind. I was definitely reading the initial Unimind assault on Krakoa as a visual of Druig's, you know, sort of an if I did it, but then it turns out to be actually happening, which is good, right? Keep this thing moving. Let's keep the action progressing. Everything here does progress very fast, and some pretty cool action sequences are cut short, even though Valerio Shidi and Mardi Gracia draw the hell out of them, which likely works as a reminder that this is simply the opening event issue, right? This is just the first issue. Between the growing number of tie-ins and future event issues, Judgment Day alone has six more from here. We'll see plenty of this filled in, I imagine. Now, before the Eternals' Jack of Knives can take out more than Egg, aka Gold Balls, ineffectually trying to rebrand, a la Paul George trying to give himself the nickname Playoff P, Wolverine sniffs out the Eternal Jack of Knives and keeps him from killing Hope Summers. So the mission to take out the five fails, and it fails fairly spectacularly. It does re-raise the interesting question of of how valuable and irreplaceable each of the five is. Egg is resurrected here because he had conveniently prepped some resurrection eggs ahead of time, but like, what if he hadn't? I'm generally operating on the assumption that there are contingencies in place for all of the five, but honestly, when I put faith in Krakoan planning, that tends to be a letdown. Speaking of which, the Krakoan invasion is not actually Druig's primary goal, as he simultaneously frees Uranos, the in quotes grandfather of Thanos, who was banished to Eternal's exclusion ages ago for his firmly held belief that the only good deviant is a dead deviant. This is not hyperbole, it's like his whole deal. Druig gives Uranos one hour to go to Arako and cause as much destruction as possible. Early in Judgment Day, there's a convenient breakdown of Krakoan and Arakian population. Krakoa's population is 200,000, Arako is straight up a million. It's a stealthy reminder that planet Arako is full of five times the number of mutants as Krakoa, and from a fierce warrior culture and background of eternal war in Ameth. 
Put another way, there's something Druid clearly recognizes here. Arako is a greater threat to the Eternals than mere Krakoa. So he unleashes his most devastating weapon there to make a point, and to make travel between Arako and Krakoa a huge challenge, as Urano smashes all of the Krakoan gateways. Now, so far we have precisely one page of Uranus's actions on Arako, so there's a lot more to come and to be explained. But what we see is a devastated red planet, including what appears to be Magneto's helmet and Abigail Brand's sunglasses amidst a pile of bones. As often as Krakoa has been invaded, they have not actually really gone to war yet. Ten of Swords was close, but remember that was war by proxy, with a select number of champions allowed in Otherworld for the tournament. So seeing them consistently on their heels due to invasion is far from surprising at this point. Arako, though, is a warrior planet. Seeing Uranos has done this to Arako in one hour is chilling, and it is meant to be. And the ramifications of these actions are pretty significant. For starters, we have very recently seen in the pages of the Al Ewing written X-Men Red that many on Arako's Great Ring, their ruling council, are opposed to Krakoan resurrection, under the general philosophy that it's a crutch and it devalues their lives. In order to take and maintain seats on the council, both Magneto and Storm agree, at least in you know principle, to this line of thinking. So if one or both of them was actually dead, and let's be clear, I don't think we'd get the death of Magneto off-panel and as conveyed merely by his helmet, resurrection would actually be in doubt. And that's kind of the thing with the entire Arako population. I have no idea how many of them would be up for resurrection. Forget just the practical effort of the five bringing huge numbers of mutants back, right? This is already a challenge in the best of times. Many Arako mutants might not want to come back. We don't know the full effect of Uranus' rampage, but it's already status quo shattering. Resurrection is in play, but it's also very much in question. An intriguing potential oversight by Druig and pals here is the Galactic Alliance. Arako is capital planet of the Soul System, a Soul System that has major political alliances across the Marvel Cosmos. How will that all shake out? Despite planet Arako's generous gifts of Mysterium, I could definitely see some of the alliances backing away, but the likes of Doric VIII, aka Teddy Altman, T'Challa of Wakanda, and Richard Ryder of the Guardians of the Galaxy, they're all Earthborn. Could they really sit back and do nothing as an ally is raised? to the ground. The most meaningful consideration here is on an emotional, traumatic level. Uranus' apparent genocide is of a whole culture that reads as black to many readers. There are metaphorical implications here that are going to really hit some readers. On top of that, you have Magneto and Storm both losing societies they've committed to and sworn to protect, not for the first time. In the case of Magneto, time and time again. There are some serious stakes at play with this level of devastation, and it's something I hope, and expect, Gillen and creators will handle with care in ensuing issues. Again, we don't even know what the exact impact is at this point, so a little bit of this is TBD. Now, in terms of stopping Uranus and getting vengeance, I can think of two very cool options in play, both utilizing two of my favorite Marvel villains. The first is that Druig inevitably loses control of Uranus and desperately needs to stop him before losing his own control of the Eternals of Earth. Remember, Druig's smugness of his own immortality is largely predicated on the fact that the Eternals remain so, you know, eternal, as long as the Earth is maintained. But what happens when Uranus destroys the whole damn planet? So Druid could go back to Thanos and insist he stop his granddaddy before gaining his own freedom back and becoming finally whole again, which is, you know, kind of what he's been trying to do throughout the previous 12-issue Eternals run by Kieran Gillen and Isad Rivich. This feels fairly likely, and of a piece with Gillen's Eternals run to this point. Either way, I expect the Druid Prime era to end by event's end, perhaps with Cersei next in line to take over the throne. But the other option is the return of the all wait, no wait, he didn't just say what I think he did, did he? Apocalypse. This is slightly less expected, but makes just as much sense, if not more so, given Apocalypse's ties to Krakoa, Arako, and get this, the Celestials and the Eternals. Indeed, one of the earliest videos I ever made, Cracking Krakoa number 8, worked in a theory about how this era could connect Apocalypse and the Eternals. My moment has come. But seriously, X-Fans are just biding our time until Big Daddy A comes back and returning with Genesis, his wife, to save Arako would be a worthy return. Those are his people, right? These are his mutants, or his culture's mutants, after all. The other piece of Druig's multifaceted attack is to foment fear and hatred, or more fear and hatred, towards mutants amongst humanity. Given base layer resentment and recent taking of Mars and the perception that they're hoarding immortality, this does not take much of a push. Druig promises to protect 
the humans but unleashes the hex off US borders, getting the attention of the Avengers, who were already thoroughly interrogating Cersei, knowing a war was coming. Now, this is the first we've seen of the Hex, six Eternals who have until this point remained classified. And as robot dinosaur transformers, that is of course the right. The names and designs of the Hex were only shared after this issue came out by artist Valerio Shidi on Screen Rant, where he wonderfully describes them as primal and killing machines. Their names are things like Theika, the Harpsicus, Teddy Trona, Sign, the Memetor, Phoebe Reginex, <laughs> Rihaka Centaurus, and Themex. This should keep the X-Men and Avengers busy, despite the Eternals' very limited numbers. As we all know from the Eternals run, there are 100 Eternals, or perhaps 101. Now, it's a strong opening issue in what promises to be an engaging blockbuster event, and if you're a fan of X-Men comics, it's clearly going to be a must to follow the Krakoa era in full. I mean, this first issue makes clear what I thought was going to be clear going into this, but the Avengers are definitely set dressing <laughs> in this event. I'll be curious if they become anything more than that as it goes. Really, really this is the Eternals vs. X-Men War. Now, I did not mention yet the stinger that this issue ends on is Makari, Ajax, and their captured Mr. Sinister showing up to request the aid of Tony Stark in their efforts to build a god, aka their efforts to build a new celestial. That's something that was teased in the Eve of Judgment. Here they are now requesting the aid of, of course, the Master of Machines, Tony Stark. That's going to be an ongoing thread here as well. To what ends? I got to admit... I'm still fairly unclear. Thanks for listening, everybody, and especially thanks to those of you who are supporting Comic Book Herald over on patreon.com slash comic book herald. Thanks to those of you supporting at the Mysterious Benefactors tier. One of the benefits you get is your name in these videos. Thank you, Jesse W., Richard Renz, Catherine Chandler, Adam, Joshua Bentley, Tread91, Alma, Terranort, John Doe, Pinball Drew, Mike Solomons, Matt Mahoney, and Chris Mervicka. Thanks so much for your generous support. I'm Dave. You can find all my stuff at comicbookherald.com, at comicbookherald on Twitter and Instagram. Look for the best comics ever and my Marvelous Year podcasts for more. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And, as always, enjoy the comics.